My name is Kendra Dean and I am a Spanish language translator and interpreter. I currently hold a master's in Spanish translation and interpretation and am also a certified Texas teacher in the areas of Spanish and math and work as a translator and interpreter for a Texas school district in addition to working with Austin Certified Translation, soon to be Texan Translation. And today I'm going to talk with you about communicating and building trust with LEP families. Today in our presentation, we're going to be talking about communicating and building trust. So first we'll discuss LEP populations across the United States and in Texas and the languages that they speak. And then we'll discuss how language, culture, and communication are related. And then finally, how we can think about all those concepts together to be able to meet the communication needs of our LEP populations in our schools. The term LEP was born out of a 1974 U.S. Supreme Court case. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the San Francisco United School District had violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and that it had discriminated against Chinese-speaking students by failing to provide them with adequate English language instruction. And so the term LEP came about and this stands for Limited English Proficient. Some people say LEP, some people say LEP, but the term LEP or LEP describes those individuals who don't speak English as their primary language and they have an, a, a limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. So the LEP student population in Texas has really grown astronomically over the past several decades. In 1975, that's when the LEP program was first started, and there were 25,000 LEP students enrolled in the program. And then fast forward about 20 years, and that number has grown quite a bit, as you can see, to almost 426,000 students, or almost 12% of all students enrolled. And then another 15 years later, it grew about 82%, and the students now accounted for almost 17% of the total enrollment. And 2007-2008 is the most current statewide data available at this time, but you can be sure that the student population has continued to grow um, in number of students, as has the LEP student population. As you can see, the percentage of LEP individuals in Texas is actually higher than the percentage across the United States. Over the United States as a whole, it's almost 9% of the population, but in Texas, the percentage of LEP individuals accounts for just over 14%. And if you look at the data for Travis County and Williamson County, you can see that Travis County is also higher up in, as far as the percentage of LEP individuals, whereas Williamson County is not quite as high in its percentage of LEP individuals, but that number has been increasing over the past few years. It's not surprising that Spanish is the most widely spoken language other than English, both in Texas and the United States. And if you look at this chart, you'll see that the percentage of Spanish-speaking LEP Texans is greater than the percentage of Spanish-speaking LEP individuals across the United States. In fact, Spanish-speaking LEP Texans alone account for almost a fifth of all LEP individuals nationwide. After Spanish, either Vietnamese or Chinese is the second most widely spoken foreign language. In the United States, Chinese outranks Vietnamese, but in general in Texas, the percentage of speakers of Vietnamese is greater than that of speakers of Chinese. And then the last language for which there's a significant number of speakers is Korean. And after that, you just have the other category which encompasses all other foreign languages spoken by LEP individuals. Language is both a tool and a symbolic system that we use to exchange information about our values, perceptions, and identities. And language has to work alongside culture in order to share this information. So people who speak different languages or people from different cultural backgrounds are going to share this information in different ways. The iceberg concept of culture is a frequently cited model of culture. The majority of culture is not easily observed, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. 
If you look at this model here and think about the school environment, we can see where there might be a lot of areas where you can have pitfalls, such as approaches to problem solving, eye behavior, handling of emotions, conversation patterns, notions of adolescence, tempo of work, just to name a few. So whenever we're talking about working with people from a different culture or who speak a different language and have a different culture, you can see that on the very top is what is easily seen or what you really think about when you think about culture. And on the bottom part of the iceberg, the large chunk of what makes up culture are different factors that are harder to perceive. Thinking about the model of culture from the previous slide, mentally, many people place more importance on the observable aspects of culture when there's really so much more to be known about a culture. So in the school environment, if you look at these non-observable or uh, out of awareness factors of culture, such as expectations or concepts of time, uh, you can see where we might run into some problems. Expectations in particular can define how students interact with their superiors, like teachers and staff, or what families expect of teachers' interactions with their children. Um, in addition, we have uh, more subtle things about culture that you might not understand if you're not a member of that culture. Uh, so the ways that culture affects personality or that it seemingly affects personality can really influence the opinions of teachers when they're thinking about the student behaviors or work ethic in their classes. When it comes to thinking about language, communication, and culture, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the non-observable aspects of culture also need to be considered for effective communication. So you can't just think of language alone. You have to take the language alongside the culture in order for there to be effective communication. And so even when we're speaking the same language to English speakers, they'll have difficulties communicating effectively if they're not taking into account the non-observable aspects of culture. And an easy example of this is um, working in Texas in our school districts, you might have students that come from a rural background into a big city school district or vice versa, and things are just not done the same way in a small town as they are in a big city. So you have students, even from a similar geographic location, let's say central Texas, who will have very different cultures, even when speaking the same language, just because of where they come from. So that's just exaggerated more when you have families that speak different languages uh, coming into American schools, or they might be Americans that come from a different linguistic background and they're going to have a different culture than that of the U.S. mainstream culture. A popular method for classifying culture is to identify where the cultures fall on a scale of low context and high context cultures. American mainstream culture is considered to be low context, and looking at the most commonly spoken languages by LEP individuals such as Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, uh, we can see that our interactions with LEP families will likely be between low context and high context cultures. The main difference to note is that low context cultures focus on what is directly said, whereas high context cultures place emphasis on what goes unsaid. So people aren't just going to be listening to the words you say, but how you say them. And they'll also be looking at your body language, your facial expressions, your eye contact. Uh, they'll listen to the tone of your voice if they're from a higher context culture than those from lower context cultures. Whenever it comes to interactions between low context and high context cultures, there's a lot of opportunity to accidentally offend each other. <laughs> so whenever you look at this model here, we see that relationships are different between two, the two cultures. So in low context cultures, we tend to establish and end relationships quickly. So we might act like we know someone, even if we've only just met them purely because we know about that person. Whereas in a high context culture, it takes more time to build relationships and establish that trust. And in the world of education, relationships are very important. So just looking at this one cultural area of difference, we can see where there might be some pitfalls. And then additionally, um, another area is uh, privacy and space. And so this can affect how students 
behaviors are perceived by their teachers or staff members. In American culture, we tend to value privacy and space, whereas in high context cultures, personal space is shared. You don't necessarily have that personal bubble that Americans love so much. And then whenever it comes to time, in low context cultures, which as American mainstream uh, individuals, we value our punctuality and um, getting things done quickly and not wasting any time. Whereas in high context cultures, you can take your time to do what needs to be done. Time is more fluid. Punctuality is not as important as it is in U.S. mainstream culture. So understanding these differences can help you to not be offended or to accidentally offend someone else from another culture. Not only is it easy to accidentally offend others during interactions between low context and high context cultures, it's also easy to create confusion. So whenever you're interacting with people from a different cultural background, whether or not they speak the same language, you need to be on the lookout for signs that they're not understanding you. Many times because of preconceived notions about the roles between superiors and subordinates or gender roles, so on and so forth, people aren't going to come right out and say, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. So these are some classic signs that people might not be understanding you. Uh, the first one, responding yes or no to either or questions, definitely shows that people aren't understanding that there's some type of choice or that they need to make some type of decision about what you're saying. Um, and then you have classic things like the tilted head, furrowed brows, looking around the room to see if anybody else might be confused, avoiding eye contact, um, glancing up and down between uh, papers that they might have and then the speaker uh, to try to see where the disconnect is. Covering the mouth with a hand typically shows that someone has a question they want to ask, but maybe they're not sure whether they should ask it or how to ask it. Um, whenever it looks like people are ignoring a request, and uh, perhaps they just didn't understand that you're actually requesting something of them or they didn't know that you were speaking to them. Um, and then a lot of times whenever people have a decent grasp of English, they might repeat the answers after they've been given but they're not actually grasping quite all the details that you've tried to express to them. And then last of all, not asking questions, especially when it comes to things like special education meetings or meetings about a student's behavior. Um, that's a, an area where you should have a lot of concern as an educator that your families aren't feeling confident that they can ask you questions about what's going on. So if confusion can occur during interactions in a single language, what happens when we speak different languages? So whenever it comes to working with different languages, that's when we need to get translation or interpretation services required. Translation is often mistakenly used to describe interpretation. Translation deals specifically with written language and interpretation deals with spoken language or sign language. Translation is expressing a message that's already on paper or a written message into another written message in a different language. Whereas interpretation expresses something orally. So either you're taking what someone's saying and re-expressing that in a different language or we have a sight translation, which is reading aloud something in another language. And then whenever you're looking at interpretation, there's two tracks for interpretation. We have consecutive, which is where speakers pause during a conversation to allow uh, for taking turns between the different parties. And then during simultaneous interpretation, the conversation doesn't stop. So the interpreter will be speaking while listening. And this can take place either with special technology, like uh, using a headset and audio, um, or the interpreter will sit next to whomever needs the translation or interpretation services, and they will uh, whisper quietly so they're not disturbing the meeting as a whole and they'll transmit the message via interpretation to the party that needs the service. So if you are like me and you grew up in a small town school district in Texas, you probably never had an interpreter or translator working in your school. Um, but it's a fact that it's actually been the law for a long time that families have rights to interpretation and translation services. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I moved to a larger metropolitan area that I saw that school districts actually had interpretation and translation services for their families. 
So if you look here, it's not just a few things that address this topic, but a number of laws and regulations that over the years have been upheld time and time again to show that these services, language services, for people that don't speak English as their primary language are very important to the educational experience. So there are a few options when it comes to providing translation and interpretation services to your LEP families. Some of them are good and some of them are not so good. So today we're going to talk about Google Translate, children and family as interpreters, bilingual teachers and staff as interpreters, professional translators or interpreters, and volunteer interpreters or translators. Uh, again, if you're working in a small school district, you've likely not had interpreters and translators that work in your school, and Google Translate is probably your best friend for trying to translate materials for students that don't speak English as their primary language. Um, and there's some uses that we can use Google Translate for, and for other things, it's pretty ineffective. So the first one is translation of individual words. Um, so, for example, you can type in a word and it'll give you uh, the direct translation. However, you have to be careful because, for example, um, if you type in a word, there will be a lot of different options. So, the word back, uh, the first option you'll get if you're trying to translate into Spanish is back, like the back of your body. But then it also says, see 44 possible translations. And so, you have to scroll through and make sure that you're picking the correct translation. Uh, for the context that you're trying to work in. And then we also um, can use it for common sayings and phrases. It's not always totally accurate, but most of the time if it's a set phrase, um, then it'll be accurately done with Google Translate. You can use short blocks of text if you have the ability to read and make corrections, but if you don't speak the language you're translating into, then it's unlikely that you'll be able to verify whether or not it's correct. And then the last thing that it actually is pretty useful for is that if you have a material that's already been translated, you can put it into Google, paste the text into Google Translate, and it'll play it aloud for you in that language. And although it sounds kind of robotic, um, if you don't have anyone that's able to speak that language and you need to read something aloud to a LEP individual, then it can be pretty useful for that. Uh, but it's very ineffective for anything complex, uh, anything that requires clarification, legal text, mainly because it can open you up to some uh, lawsuits or um, big problems if you translate something erroneously and it's something that people need to sign uh, for legal purposes. And then anything that's non-standard uh, slang, it's not great for that. Confidential and emotional content. Um, obviously, you don't want to put somebody's confidential information out on the internet, and then uh, emotional things are best handled by a human that can transmit the emotions of the message that you're needing to convey. But the inherent problem with Google Translate is that if you don't understand or speak the target language, you really just don't have a way of verifying the accuracy of your translation. Um, and some people try to back translate with Google Translate, which just means that you take a text, you put it in Google Translate, and let's say you're doing English to Spanish. Well, then you take the Spanish text that came from Google Translate, try to plug it back in, and translate it into English via Google Translate to check and make sure it sounds good, but that actually doesn't really work. And if you're interested in knowing more about back translation and why it doesn't work, um, you can just Google um, back translation gone bad, and you can find tons of examples where it's just shown to not be very accurate. Oftentimes, the easiest interpreter to grab to help you to communicate with an LEP family is a student, um, but it's best when, whenever possible to avoid using children as interpreters. Um, children should not have to interpret on their own behalf whenever it comes to discussing their academic or behavioral difficulties. Um, they're not an unbiased party to discussing their own classroom difficulties, and it can put them under a lot of stress to discuss anything negative whenever they're serving as the interpreter. Um, and then they're not necessarily going to notify the parties when they don't understand something because they're not going to stop adults mid-conversation to clarify terminology or um, some concept that they didn't understand in the conversation. And then last of all, it can put them in an awkward position of authority over parents. So sometimes 
when children are interpreting if it's just about something um, minor like hey we have a classroom party on Friday or something positive that a teacher wants to say then it can be a source of pride for students but also it might be kind of embarrassing for the parents that they're not able to understand English like their students their children are able to do and so it can create this awkward dynamic between the families um, especially if we're talking about um, cultures where the parents are more of an authority over the children um, it just depends on what cultural backgrounds the parents and children are from and on whether or not, not that can create a real problem. And if students aren't available to interpret, oftentimes schools will turn to bilingual teachers and staff. Um, but there's a few reasons why they, although they may be able to provide some of the necessary services, they might not be the best choice. So teachers and staff already have a full plate of responsibilities and translation and interpretation both require time, uh, which is something that most educational workers don't really have a lot of is spare time. Um, and then secondly, it puts bilingual teachers and staff in a position of authority over the other content teachers. Um, and so an example of this is when I was a Spanish teacher at a rural school, I was one of two people on campus who actually spoke Spanish. And so a lot of times teachers would pull me to go try to talk with students, families that didn't speak English, or even, that was okay, but even worse was that the families would come directly to me instead of being able to go to their the content teachers to discuss any problems or um, handle any questions that they had. And so that made it to where the families were not able to build relationships with the monolingual teachers and staff because they felt that they couldn't go to them since they did not speak the same language. And so it not only put me in this strange position of authority over the other teachers, but it also took away those good opportunities to build relationships, which we already discussed are very important in the world of education and that it takes longer for people from high context cultures to build those relationships. Um, and then additionally, um, sometimes your bilingual teachers uh, or your foreign language teachers are not actually fluent in the target language and unfortunately this is actually not that uncommon. Uh, people with four-year degrees in a language aren't necessarily fluent in that language. And so if you don't speak the language you're needing them to interpret or translate into, then you don't really have a way of testing their skills to know whether or not they are fluent. Um, and then if you're bilingual teachers and staff, uh, they might be fluent in both languages, but they might not be familiar with the terminology. So for example, I work generally in the world of special education, and there's so many acronyms and different terms that are used uh, that I had no idea existed even as a teacher until I worked with special education students particularly then I had to learn all of this new terminology and so bilingual teachers and staff might not be familiar with that unless they're trained in that area and then last of all if your teachers and staff are interpreting on their own behalf um, they're not unbiased third parties and so they might interject their own in, uh, opinions into the conversation or they'll sidetrack the conversation between monolingual speakers so they'll leave out one party or the other by going in a side going off in a side conversation with the English speaking party or the Korean speaking party and um, so it's that's where you can have some pitfalls whenever you're relying on uh, bilingual teachers and staff as your interpreters and translators Additionally, when we're talking about using bilingual teachers and staff as interpreters, um, you need to keep in mind that bilingualism alone does not indicate proficiency. So bilingualism means that someone has a knowledge of two different languages or maybe more, and they have basic interpersonal communication skills and they read and write at a functional level. Whereas someone that is proficient in another language, they're literate in that language, they're able to write well in that language, they have the ability to translate and interpret, and they have a high level of cognitive academic language proficiency.
So there's a reason that not every bilingual person is an interpreter or translator. There's something to be said for having some training and the proper skill set. Interpreting in particular requires the ability to keep track of and organize lots of little details and then relate those details without error or missing anything um, back to their audience. And so just because you're bilingual doesn't mean that you have that specific skill that you need to be an accurate interpreter. Um, and so whenever you're looking at trained bilingual employees or translators and interpreters, they're going to be unbiased third parties. Uh, they'll be able to have a good understanding of both cultures and not just the linguistic aspects of the cultures, but those hidden under the surface aspects of culture that we oftentimes miss unless we're on the lookout for them. They also have verified skills in both languages, so you're not going to have someone that um, doesn't actually speak the foreign language that you think they speak. Um, that'll be verified that they have the necessary skills. And they'll also have a good understanding and be proficient in the specialized terminology such as special ed terminology or um, if it's about uh, math or science or something like that, a specialized content area, then your interpreter or translator will have a good knowledge of that very particular language that goes along with the content area. Although it's best to have professional translators and interpreters whenever possible, if your school is on a budget, as many schools are, there are still some good options for providing quality language services to your LEP families. So the first one would be to look at finding pro bono services, and these websites here have information on how to find uh, translation and interpretation services. Um, and then you can look at getting some volunteers from the community or from colleges. Many college programs offer some form of interpretation or translation training in the foreign language colleges. Um, and so those students would have a professor that could verify that that individual actually does speak or read and write the language at the necessary level to provide the services. You can also look for grant funds. Um, to find contract interpreters and translators. And cheaper than in-person interpreting, you can use telephonic or video remote interpreting, which is what a lot of hospitals use if they don't have the LEP population necessary to make them have a full-time uh, interpreter or translator. And then again, if your school is small and you don't require full-time services, you can look at competitive bidding to get translation projects done. Um, so you can have a company that's your contract translation or interpretation company that can provide as-needed services. And then last, um, if you need to, you can provide some training for your bilingual staff members so that they're better able to meet your interpretation and translation needs. But again, that would be an additional duty for bilingual staff. So provided that they have the time to do that during the day, then they could be a good resource for translation and interpretation services. And finally, as we previously discussed in the section on culture, relationships are important in the world of education, and it takes time to build quality relationships with LEP families, especially those from high context cultures. So a little bit of effort on your end and brushing up on your language skills can actually translate into greatly increased trust and a better framework for communication with LEP families. Uh, so even if you won't become fluent through your efforts, you might still be able to really show these families that you care about their culture and you care to make the effort to communicate with them. And that'll help to build trust with them and help them to open up more and communicate with the school better. So some free resources are um, apps or websites. Uh, we have Duolingo, HelloTalk, Busu. There's a ton of other ones. Duolingo in particular is super easy to use. You can put it on your phone and do daily lessons. And research actually shows that completing the Duolingo course um, is more effective than a semester of foreign language in a college. So uh, you can actually learn quite a bit from doing that. And then paid resources, uh, the ones listed here, we have italki, Babbel, and Fluens. And um, for example, italki, you actually interact with a person who speaks the foreign language via the internet. And so if you're looking to practice your Portuguese skills or your Korean skills, then you'll have an online tutor that you speak with over the internet and um, actually practice your conversation skills. So it's not just like textbook learning.
And then some other ideas are that you can take advantage of all the foreign language content on Netflix. They're constantly adding more Spanish language content, Korean language content amongst other shows. Um, and there's a lot of interesting shows on there, documentaries, sitcoms, all kinds of things that you can watch. And then meetup.com groups. If you go to meetup.com, if you're in a large area like the Austin area or the Dallas area, um, you can find a meetup.com group for almost any language that you're wanting to practice. And then the best one would be, if you can, try to interact with others in your community who speak that language, uh, whether it's at school functions or um, in the park. If you meet people in the community, don't be embarrassed to say, hey, I want to be able to interact with my students who speak such and what language can I practice with you. And most of the time, people will let you practice with them a little bit as long as you're polite. <laughs> Anyways, um, so these are some of the resources that you can use. There are tons of other ones, um, podcasts and things like that. So good communication takes work and some knowledge, but in the end it definitely pays off in student achievement. So if you can take the time to learn about others and their language and their culture, you're going to be able to better identify their needs and then you can meet those needs, uh, which to do that if they speak another language, you'll need to provide or find adequate language services. And once you do that, that will help you to build relationships with these families and also build trust with them which will help them to want to communicate better with the school and it'll create more community with the LEP families within your schools and in your community and that just feeds back into itself creating more trust and better communication with these families. If you're interested in learning more about the topics that we discussed today, here is a list of our sources used for the presentation. Here is the last page of sources used for the presentation. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation on working with our LEP families in the school environment and that it'll help you to be able to better communicate with your students and their families. <laughs>